Okay, hello, off we go. Welcome to tonight's ISH guest lecture, part of a series in which uh, we invite a wide range of speakers uh, to address all aspects of heritage, um, heritage science, cultural heritage policy, research, um, in a variety of formats. This is a new format for us, um, for obvious reasons, we're doing this remotely. Um, bear with us, we'd be really interested in your feedback, any comments on how this is working or not working, um, please do share it, share with us. We're keen that this, make, that this works for us all. I'm very grateful to Maya Powell and Velvet Young, who are behind the scenes, um, ensuring that all this runs very smoothly. Thanks very much, Maya. Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Veronica Sakulas, um, curator, author, educator, and environmentalist. Uh, she'll be sharing her experiences as the founder of the Groundwork Gallery, um, a space for art concerned with how we relate to the world. Um, before we hear from Veronica, just a quick word from me on the format, and then I will um, get out of the way. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end. You should be able to see on your um, Zoom menus down at the, at the bottom a Q&A option. If you want to share your questions during the talk with that, what will happen is at the end of the talk, I will um, uh, moderate the, the short Q&A session with Veronica. We would normally have at the end of this talk an opportunity for us all to meet each other, to um, you know, to share a glass of wine or something and have a nibble and a chat. Um, we can't re replicate that online I'm afraid but we will have a chat window open for 10 or 15 minutes afterwards where we can share our thoughts um, in, a, in a more informal way. That I think for the moment is enough from me um, and I shall hand over to Veronica. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard, and good evening, everybody. This is a very strange experience, a new experience for me, um, doing a remote lecture. I've sat in webinars before, but I, I've not delivered one yet. So I should be, yes, interested to see how it goes. So I'm talking about art and environment from curating to campaigning. Um, and it's really based around my experience having founded an art gallery in Kings Lynn called Groundwork, which I'll tell you all about. So what I'm planning to do is to set the scene a little bit about, in general, about the environment and art. And then I'll give you some case studies um, from the gallery itself and outline how I move from curating to campaigning throughout with everything I do. So first of all, now, in fact, this is a, a version of this lecture I gave in 2018. Um, to a, a local group and I started with something I'd just been to then, um, the Nature Matters Conference in Stanford um, run by um, uh, regarding nature. And anyway, it was a, a discussion between Baroness Young and Caroline Lucas about whether conventional politics could save the environment. And I, the reason I've left this in is that it seemed very topical and relevant then, but suddenly now you can tell how very different the situation is and the very idea that conventional politics can save the environment seems quite absurd now. In fact, at the time, the discussion, they were very um, critical of that themselves and felt that it, was, it would require a tremendous amount of, of global Co cooperation to have any effect on saving the environment. But um, so if we think about what at the, at the time, um, in fact, the context then was the, um, the government's own 25 year environment plan um, was just coming um, into being and very much criticized. And you can see from the on the top left, um, the summary of targets, clean air at the top of it, um, seems a little, um, shall we say, well, not, not entirely a priority, quite a priority, but there could be others. Um, and then below is, is Friends of the Earth, um, their announcement of COP26, which will be held in Glasgow in November, we hope, um, the United Nations Climate Summit, and system change, or not climate change. You can already see the difference um, that we want a really big, big things to happen in order for there to be an, an effect on environment and the environmental change. 
Then um, um, last year was the State of Nature report. There have been, of course, annual State of Nature reports, but some startling key findings. Um, and there at the top right, you see the list of many, many, many organizations that contributed to this and the key findings. But um, that there were, and I need to look at my notes here because I the, the, the writing on the, on the slide is too small. But um, that th over the last 10 years, one of the findings was that there's been 44% species decline as opposed to 36% species increase. So overall, um, species are declining faster than they're increasing. And we know that there's some tremendous um, high examples among the, the declines. I'll talk a bit more later about moths, of which, whom there have been a 30% decline in the last 10 years. And also birds, um, there are um, 70 birds on the endangered list. So there's tremendous worry about nature, about declining species. Um, and then the other thing that's really changed and made one think politics has been left somewhat behind um, is Extinction Rebellion. And here's the Red Brigade confronting the police. Um, that's been one of the most exciting developments in terms of environmental activism um, in the last a couple of years. Well, last year, in effect, it's very, very new. And it's, it's some, well, you can see here how it acts like it's a street theater movement almost. It's very, um, it's very visual um, and very public and, and is taking up the mantle of the first environment movement from the 70s when everything was done on the streets and through marching. Of course, now, now that has changed um, very, very suddenly. And the reason I'm, I'm meeting you not uh, only virtually, um, the coronavirus lockdown, ironically, might be having an effect on our, our carbon reduction targets. And you can see that from this empty car park in the United States. So who knows whether this will be a lasting effect, but um, it could be, you know, an unlooked for bonus or perhaps, you know, something we will then build, be able to build on. So I'm now moving on to talk about the gallery. Um, so the gallery, it, bearing in mind, I mean, my background is in curating and I ran an education department at Sainsbury Centre at, at the University of East Anglia for many years. Um, but also um, I, my, my baby career was in the environment movement as an activist. And um, so I, I'm really combining all of that with this gallery. And here we've got a view of um, the square nearby where the custom house is uh, situated on the quayside in the King's Lynn, which is a market town in, in by the Wash in East Anglia, um, northwest East Anglia. And um, the gallery um, is a little box you might be able to see it ringed in orange. Um, and it was a little 1930s warehouse, um, two story, um, built as a carpenter's workshop and it had been empty for 20 years and granny died basically and left money and so we were able to buy it and um, that was the start of what became has become a massive project um, and we extended it upwards put, put on a roof and this is what it look, looked like it look, looks slightly different now but it that's what it looked like when it first opened and um, I decided and that's the side view with a balcony. I thought long and hard about what to do with it and decided I really didn't want anyone else to get their hands on it and that because of my background and interests it had to be an art gallery and it had to concentrate on the environment. Oh, this is the a view from the custom house. The top floor is a holiday rental and that pays for the gallery so that's part of the business plan but also it's right in the river. I mean, it's mad as, a, as an investment project, but anyway, it sits right in the water. Um, and it, that was another reason from concentrating on the environment, apart from my background, it's in a floodplain. It's probably you know, quite likely to um, get flooded, <laughs> possibly quite badly, possibly engulfed in the, in the fullness of time. But it's so far, it hasn't ever been flooded. So, um, you know, so far, so good. But that's another reason really to think very seriously about the environment in this context. 
So my opening exhibition, I decided I wanted a big name and I went to my friend Roger Ackling, who was at the time dying of motor neurone disease and said, Roger, please will you be, do me the honour of being my first artist because I'd like a big name. And he said, well, I'll ask my friend Richard, who was Richard Long. Now, if you're not in the art world, these names will mean nothing to you. As I subsequently discovered, I thought, wait, well, hey, I've got a great name here. But the first thing I had to do to someone very prominent in Kings Lynn, um, when I said, oh, I've got Richard Long on my first, as my first artist, they said, can you spell that, please? So uh, that made me immediately realize I could take nothing for granted in terms of reputation. However, um, everyone has some understanding of the environment and some response to it. And um, so this exhibition was called Sunlight and Gravity. By, this, by the time it opened, Roger had very sadly died. But Richard Long um, was very much part of it and he made the work. So just going back quickly, that um, brown mark on the wall is Richard Long's Great Ooze mud, mud drawing or Great Ooze River drawing, um, which he made in situ by throwing um, mud from the river at the wall. And, and it's now become a signature work and lives there the whole time. And here he is talking to students um, about it afterwards. He very rarely appears in public, but he agreed to do that. So that was a great gift. Um, and it is always a talking point. Of course, people ask me all the time, did the builders throw their coffee at the wall and so forth. And so it always is a bit of a starting point because I show, I can say, well, look, this you're seeing the river in a way you've never seen it before because the way the mud dried, it showed the soil structure in a wonderful way. So it's a very beautiful work. So then um, that after that show, um, I was made aware of the Woodland Trust campaign um, for a tree charter. And I was invited to be um, a tree champion for the town. And so I thought, well, I will move my, I, I, I'd already got plans for the gallery. I'll move things around a bit so I can, um, put on a special exhibition that ties in with this campaign. So Out of the Wood came from that, and there are about 10 artists involved in this. And incidentally, it says at the bottom, the importance of graphic identity. I had a brilliant, brilliant graphic designer right from the beginning, who's made an enormous difference to the gallery and to its professional look and its consistency. So if you're ever going to run a gallery, I, I recommend that you get a graphic designer early in the day. So, um, so this, this was a varied exhibition with works that, in, that were made from wood, that were sculptural, um, that also there were paintings. And alongside it, um, we decide, decided to work with the Borough Council and the Civic Society to run a campaign for trees. And so we collaborated and we had a tea for trees and invited people from different, or anyone, to come along and donate towards the planting of a tree. And people were given then certificates. So that was really the first bit of campaigning, and it was very successful. It was actually one of the easiest bit of fundraising I've ever done, because the, in fact the council paid for half the tree, so people had to pay, I think it was 60 pounds, it's gone up now, but <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, 60 pounds would buy them a tree. And so we had quite a few tree donors and that's a project that is continuing. So then the next um, exhibition, um, the next big thing was another big name, Herman de Vries, who's largely very little known over here, but is a grand old man of the environment, um, a real natural philosopher, um, he's Dutch and lives in Germany, in, deep in a forest. And um, I was given an introduction to him. I wrote to him. He doesn't do email. And then he rang me immediately and said, I want to be part of your project, which was a great honor. And that year also, it turned out he was the Venice Biennale's chosen artist for the Netherlands. So he suddenly became a very big name. And there he is. He did, he was, he's um, as you could see from his um, picture, he's not, he's not young. He's in his mid-80s and he didn't come to the 
opening, but he sent us a film um, to talk about himself and his work. And there you can see him sitting in what he calls his studio, which is the forest in Steigerwald in Germany. But he made um, an exhibition about stones. Um, and on the wall there, you see a wall of um, images made with stone dust from around the world. So he's made a massive collection, like he's made, in fact, he has now a stone museum, which is situated in France. And he collects stones from everywhere and makes them into installations um, and or, or into arrangements. So here we've got, you can see his various arrangements of stone. Um, and this also led to a campaign and to thinking more widely about stone in the environment. And there is, um, um, with, in fact, it's wood, not stone, but um, Seahenge um, located in East Anglia, but also um, there's a real grounding in thinking about um, structures in the environment that go back a very, very long way. Um, and also, incidentally, um, um, I did some work at the same time, again with Richard Long, selecting Flint for um, a work he made at Houghton Hall. So there we are at the quarry, and the, on the right is the work at Houghton Hall, which was only a temporary thing. But in the longer term, we ran events, lots of events about stone, exploring the local environment, and I worked together with a geologist, again, who's, who's unfortunately no longer with us, um, but there you'll see on my, if you look at my website, in fact, it needs attention because I've got a new website that's got a few glitches, but um, there's some pages about Stones of Lynn. So we made a resource, a teaching resource out of this exhibition. So then I started to become um, more and more interested in environmental activism and worked together with another group of artists. The key person here was Jane Ivy Me, um, um, who had made a collection of um, beautiful ceramics of birds representing the birds on the red list of endangered species. And we call the exhibition Bird After Bird because as she says, bird after bird after bird is in decline. And at the time there were 70 um, birds on the red list of endangered species. And here she is at the opening, showing her work to one of the other artists. And we laid them on a tray like a mortuary slab and, and the birds were made to look as though they were, as though they, as they appear in um, spe as specimens in, in museum collections. So that was a very moving, we didn't do very much in activity with that, but it was a very moving experience and it did raise awareness of endangered birds. So then I got very wonderfully, got the Nick Reeves Award for Art and Environment, um, given by the Association of Water Engineers and the Centre for Contemporary Art and the Natural World. So that was, and that was after only being open for a year. But that felt as though you know, some really good things, right things, I seem to have been doing the right thing to some degree. So that was encouraging. Then Fire and Ice, um, again, was led by artists, um, um, actually a mother and daughter, Gina Glover and Jessica Rayner, and a potter, Hilary, Hilary Mayo. All of them had been to Iceland. Um, and so we, we, we looked, it really was ultimately about climate change. And we ran some events about climate change. We had a conference, and this is the first time I'd done that. Um, we had, um, it happened in the gallery, and Tom Burke, um, who was my former boss at Friends of the Earth many years ago, um, came and gave the keynote speak, speech, um, and the, a lot of the artists spoke. And what was interesting about it in thinking about politics um, was that somebody did comment at the time that the discussion was not like one gets in a political meeting, but was much more open to new ideas and was much more reflective than it would have been not so hectoring, but persuasive. Um, so that was quite an interesting observation. Then trash art. Now this was an artist who's in, himself an environmental activist, Jan Erik Visser, um, who's, made, who's a sculptor, he's Dutch, um, lives and works in Rotterdam, 
and make sculpture from the waste from his own household, the paper waste from his own household and other waste. So these beautiful sculptures are, um, have um, plastic waste and all sorts of things encased within them. And then they're given coating after coating of a kind of papier-mâché, but it doesn't have any medium in except paper. So it's not really true papier-mâché, it's paper pulp. And then he waxes them and all the color comes from within the, the substance of the paper. He doesn't add any pigment. Um, he's just had a big show in Schiedam in Rot near Rotterdam and also has been showcased in Art Rotterdam. Um, but this was his first show in the UK. And in a minute, I'll talk about what other things we did in activities alongside it. But also Henry Bragg showed a work about um, the Surrey Hills, which was about a landfill and ele electronic waste and little film they made about a landfill site in the Surrey Hills. And then Gina Glover, who I'd shown before in the climate change show, showed a work called The Entangled Bank about um, waste plastic bottles. And there was also a sculpture by Lee Grandjean made from plastic bottles. So um, it was quite widely in the end about waste, this exhibition. And we had quite a number of different events. Um, so we had another conference and you see at the top right, um, there's Jan Eric Visser talking in the gallery. We showed the film Trashed, um, which um, made in 2013 and narrated by Jeremy Irons and Candida Brady, the director, came and talked to us. Um, we had um, Poetry of Trash workshop and there's an outcome from it. Um, Emily Dufresne, a young poet, ran um, and we, we went, we combed the streets looking for trash <laughs> and then made um, poems relating to it. But one of the works that Jan Eric had made in preparation for the show, he'd, he'd um, walked along the banks of the river collecting rubbish and then encased it in special small sculptures, which became part of the exhibition. So there he is collecting the trash and on the right are the works he made with it. And so we decided, inspired by that, we would do the same. And he joined us for a, um, a walk along the river. And actually, we worked together with a group of women um, who were um, sufferers of domestic abuse, a charity that supported them. So um, we had this very special group, and it was funded by the British Science Association. We called the project, we called it Project Waste Transformed. And the idea was to transform waste from one's life into something positive, um, but also in literal terms into something, waste into something useful. So we did a big collection and then sat around thinking about it. And then we decided we were actually really interested in the plastic things. And so we invited Andrew Mays, who's a specialist in microplastics from University of East Anglia, to come and teach us and talk to us about plastic. And then we spent ages making little melted plastic artifacts, which Andrew adopted again with, with, as, as well with us with great enthusiasm. And so we, we became quite obsessed about this and carried on. In fact, the group carried on and still carries on. And we've now changed and we're now doing visible mending which was actually inspired by my sister who lives in New York and has a big visible mending um, project herself. So we've worked together with her as well. And um, so here we are, this become, has become a regular thing every Saturday, except we of course not now at the moment, but normally we would get together and sew and mend. Um, Crystal Labas, so this was another um, thinking about nature. Um, this was an exhibition, actually there was also a Dutch connection because this exhibition had been shown um, in Holland or part of it, or rather I showed a part of the exhibition which had been shown in Holland. And this was um, panoramic three meter long photographs of Blakeney Dunes that Crystal Labas had made um, for a special project with the Natural History Museum, um, looking at um, erosion and looking at plant species. Um, and again, we had um, uh, other events going on, also showed work by Judith Tucker and Harriet Tarlow. They'd made a collaborative project about the Lincolnshire fens and disappearing landscapes. And 
so we worked together with them and had a session on e we had a conference on eco poetry um, and then we also worked with ecologists and this is all funded by the British Ecological Society as an outreach program so we looked very deeply at the coastal ecology um, both from an artistic point of view and from a scientific point of view then um, water rising um, was the next big initiative um, and that um, was a um, an exhibition um, in 2018 um, that where there were a number of artists here we've got Stuart Hearn's bottles Thames water bottles Peter Matthews who um, um, made work by sinking himself into water and floating about and doing underwater drawings and paintings um, Simon Faithful um, who made work about walking um, underwater um, so the th there was a gen a, it, it followed a general theme of water engulfing us or will water engulf us and that led to a whole series of initiatives as well um, working together with Anglian Water they sponsored some events we did a big conference um, this time not in the gallery um, but in um, um, Thoresby College which is nearby and that had um, that had quite a big impact and and I think what came from that was the idea that we would build on this kind of thing a lot more this this, this sequence of events was become seemed to be become, acquiring more relevance and more importance and as you've been able to see the number of subjects has been quite varied so far but what I began to think about after this one was how to pull some threads together so that I'm not constantly facing in different directions but actually to have a, a, a thorough thread about the environment that builds up um, consistently. But uh, um, the other parts of the programme we did with water, um, this was another British Science Week project. We worked with a, a group with learn, uh, adults with learning difficulties looking at water in the town. We called it Living with Water. And we explored the way water went through the town. Um, and we, we started with the exhibition talking about ideas, but then we moved around to look at how we could improve the use of water and teach people about the use of water and that's something that still has yet to be pursued further we only really were able to make a beginning for that but that's a project we will carry on with and indeed that was very topical at the time Kings Lynn at sea level um, this is a climate rebellion um, act, uh, activism at the time very much that time in fact it coincided very much with that 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 whole exhibition i think it was 2019 not 2018 by the way um so the curation part of it um everything i've done at the gallery has started from work with artists and in every case i've got to know the artists i don't pick up people remotely <laughs> might have to now but um, don't uh, everyone I've been to the studios or people have come to see me I very often now in fact increasingly artists contact me are uh, very interesting artists a lot of them and make proposals and very often I've been able to include them in things so that's how I picked actually most of the artists that you see on the screen have, have come to me that way Antonia Beard in the middle for instance just turned up one day and we got on very well and I went to see her studio and she's back where I am there or other a show she was in and she subsequently showed at the end of last year the little encounter at the bottom left um, was Paca Sanchez a French artist and Elspeth Owen who's um, a ceramicist um, in Cambridge just outside Cambridge and they um, met for, they were both included in an exhibition called fragile nature and this is the um packer came over to just to, to see me and talk about it and i introduced them to each other and there they're doing a little dance together because they realize they're both 80 at the time so that was a very charming encounter and the top left is emma howell who was also in that fragile nature exhibition 
um, and there were sorting out some of her paintings to go in it. Ground jewels. Oh yes, at the top right is Madeleine Spencer, who's a jeweller. I've always shown jewellery. I love jewellery and, um, and I've always shown jewellery also by artists, also about the environment. And we've just started an, a relatively new initiative to build on that because it's always been there, but never really made very much of it. So I got an EU grant well, hey, um, to um, work on this. And, and um, a, a very nice woman, Naomi Langford, is helping me. And we're doing a whole new marketing strand on, called, we've called it Ground Jewels. And we're promoting um, ethical jewellery, um, and which is actually, it's, we're enjoying it very much. So you'll, I'm sure, be able to see that. There's a big social media campaign just beginning. So up to the present day, the current exhibition, um, Bugs, Beauty and Danger, did actually open with a formal opening on the 13th of March. I thought it might be the last public event for a while, and indeed it was, and it was a little bit touch and go whether to have it, because the coronavirus was just, just beginning then. And it shows how recently that was and how much has changed since. Um, but people did come out that night and about half the number I normally have or less than half, but it was, it did make it into, a, it did seem like a proper party. And there's the mayor giving an opening and Paul Hetherington from Bug Life. Um, so this exhibition, um, it's half, is as the title suggests um, about danger and half um, quite scary um, and a little bit creepy and there, that is a film by Jerome Eisinger another Dutch artist where a bee swarm is settling on him and it's a it's a remarkable film you can see a sn snippet of it you can't see the whole thing online um, but you can see some of it online um, and it's really about stoicism and en endurance and patience and trust because in fact those um those little animals protected him and they only stung him twice um but it's quite it's quite difficult to watch some people find it quite difficult to watch the other bugs on that screen are by um cornelia hess honiger who's a swiss artist um and these are quite well known she's shown these before um in the uk a few times um, and they are bugs that have been mutilated because of um, that low level nuclear radiation. Um, she's been visiting for 30 years. She's been visiting nuclear sites, um, both um, new sites of nuclear accidents, but also nuclear power stations and been observing the effect on bugs. And they're giving us early warning signals of the dangers we face. And it's really quite frightening um, and she has now a collection of 80,000 specimens um, and we've shown a few um, a few of them here in the exhibition um, and then on the left Claudia Ferrenkamper um, German artist has done micro photographs of bug heads and they're quite scary they're, they're very large um, and then very very beautiful Sarah Gillespie mezzotensive moths now um, and moths have become a big theme. Two of the artists concentrated on moths, um, Alison Turnbull and Sarah Gillespie. And there's a, a section on my website, a blog post about moths and why we need to be concerned about them because they've declined by 30% um, in the last 10 years. Um, there are 62 extinct species in the UK. And these are common moths that both the artists have chosen to show common moths, but they're all endangered um, and partly because we don't understand moths very well people think in fact when I've started posting about this I got a lot of oh dear my clothes get eaten yeah there's only one species that eats clothes um, and then you know that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of others um, and the insect that gets all the attention is the honeybee um, but there are plenty of others um, and indeed um, plenty of others on show in the exhibition. So this is Nicola Beeling's paintings of plagues and swarms where she's featured locusts and cockroaches and flies and creatures we'd rather not get very close to. 
Um, so we're working with Bug Life um, to raise awareness of bugs. And this came about because when I was um, in pre preparing the exhibition, I heard um, one of the, uh, I think it was probably Matt Shardler, the director of Bug Life on, on the radio just before Christmas talking about a bug um, survey they were doing. And so I looked them up and, and they're based in Peterborough and I emailed and said, look, please, you know, will you work with me? I've got this exhibition coming up. And um, they said, yeah, sure. So here we are sitting around a table with um, the per people responsible for grounds in the council and the councillor, deputy leader of the council. Um, and we are working together to improve the bee lines around Kings Lynn. The bug life have mapped the bee lines around the country and bee line is not just about bees, it's about bugs in general. And the idea is to improve the environment for them and plant more bug, fun, but more bug friendly plants, more pollinator friendly plants, and um, not to use uh, sprays and to and pursue and keep them rotting logs in corners so they can breed and so forth. Um, so we're working on that and we'll be working on that for the next couple of years. Um, and this is, I suppose, increasingly the direction I'm trying to go in is to follow through from what gets shown in the gallery to pick up messages that are often those that are started by artists and then to work politically, environmentally, um, actively um, to campaign and do something positive and think what the positive things are we can do. And I do that both um, in, in the real world, but also increasingly virtually. So I'm going to do a virtual, I'm going to do a um, social media push um, in April on how we can help bugs, probably in our homes, um, because that's probably what we're all going to be doing. So um, this is really, I think my last, I think this is my last slide, but um, I've been developing a theory of change, like a, a good, I'm not a charity at the moment, but I'm moving in that direction. Um, but moving in the direction of thinking carefully about how one does move from an idea through actions to an outcome and an impact. Um, so on the left of this chart are, um, the things I actually do, like curating exhibitions, running events, organizing discussions, um, evaluating responses, engaging with stakeholders and partners, and importantly, promoting equality and diversity. In the center are the outcomes um, and the hope, well, the hoped for outcomes, which can be evaluated. So increasing the understanding, increasing the activity, um, changing minds, getting decision makers to look globally as well as locally, etc. Um, and then ultimately thinking through to aiming what we're all aiming for um, is sustainability in the environment and an understanding of environmental change and working together. And through all the work I've done, it's become clear that working across disciplines is really important. Um, and for me, of course, it's starting with art and working with artists. Um, um, but then I've, as, as an educator, as I've learned throughout my career, art isn't an end in itself. It's a starting, well, it can be an end in itself, but it's a starting, for, from my point of view, it's a starting point. Once a work of art is made, it opens up a whole new realm. It, it, it brings into being a body of ideas that's very visible and very tactile and very workable with. And that's the duty we have as audience and receptors and curators to take that challenge and to work with it in order to pursue the ideas that art starts, gets going. And in this, I think, I hope is in a, is one of the keys to thinking about how we can change minds and thinking about the environment positively. And I think that's probably me done. There we go. Um, Thank those you. Those will be contact details. Thank you very much indeed.
One of the worst things about this format is not being able to see the response in the room uh, or, or hear the well deserved <laughs> applause, which, which I'm, I'm going to assume we can all fill in ourselves. But I found that incredibly thought provoking, stimulating, and provocative. I, I'm really taken by the way that you're the situatedness of the gallery and the way you start with the kind of the actual soil and the ground of the water that you're in um, give you this platform to connect with the global concerns of water and, and kind of equitable access to the environment, biodiversity, and so on. Um, inspirational, thank you. I'm going to move to the Q&A. We have some questions, thank you very much. Um, there's, a, there's one here I'm going to just kick off with, but well, it's kind of two. It's really about the current position that we're in, um, thinking about the COVID-19 position that we're in. I wondered what your, your gallery was doing to continue functioning, what kind of form you're going to have, um, and also how what kind of ways do you would you be able to engage with people who are cut off perhaps uh, perhaps but not so confident with, with tech technology yeah so it's very tricky i mean the first thing i did was postpone everything um well first thing i did was close the gallery um and then think oh goodness what what how do i what do i do um <laughs> and so i postponed everything um so the current show, which was due to finish on the 30th of May, um, if it was going to do that, no one would see it because we'll probably still be locked down, at least only just emerging by then. So that is now um, extended until September. And the exhibition that was due to be in the summer, Japan Water, is going to happen next year. And in fact, it was due to tie in with the Olympics. It probably still will now. Um, I might yet extend further if things get worse and move the autumn show into next year as well, but I'm waiting to see really what happens. So that's one thing. Um, social media, I mentioned, I'm, I'm stepping up and preparing to do a thing in April, uh, concentrating on bugs. Um, and I've got a new website, which I'm trying to perfect and get better and I've got time to work on it. Um, and in terms, of, I'm, I'm, in terms of how long this goes on, um, I mean, I'm rethinking, you know, what happens if we can't meet, if we can't, you know, if this goes on and on and on and we can't do things, I, you know, I can't have conferences in Thoresby College, what do I do? I am planning to have, um, to step up the kind of global network for art and environment, I might call it a forum. And it, this has made me think what we're doing now, you know, Zoom meetings might have to, there might have to be many more of these kinds of things and have virtual discussions. Um, and the trick will be to try and replicate as far as possible the effect of a small meeting in a small room, as Margaret Mead said, that nothing, no, <laughs> nothing in the world has changed more effectively than through small meetings in small rooms, or that sort of paraphrase, but anyway, that sort of thing. Um, and it makes one realize how interconnected we are and how we need that. We, you know, we really need to continue that somehow. As far as how to engage with people that are not so good at social media, I guess we might be back to writing letters and ringing up and, um, and sending things in the post. Um, and hoping that the post works, you know, and just, you know, going back to some older methods of communicating. Yeah. How, how, how far do you feel that you and smaller galleries like yours um, might be in a position to provide a space for innovation in, in this way? And I don't mean innovation in a technical sense, but I mean, I feel like Zoom and Skype, well, I mean, for some reason, not, reason not Skype, but Zoom has kind of magically appeared as the ready to hand answer yeah. to replace things. Um, the technologies that we use direct us down certain paths, certain modes of interaction. There are certain assumptions by the designers about what they're going to be used for and what we need. We have a QA and a option that the developers coded in, for example, which tells you a lot about how they expect this to be used. And I wondered if um, your community of artists, your, your networks might be able to think of different ways of interacting that are um, maybe address different aspects of how we want to connect with each other and, and the world. I mean, one yeah. of the things that really strikes me here is the only way we're connecting with the world here is through the kind of the various rare earth minerals that are in the devices that we're all using to, <laughs> to, to see this. You know, if there's a way yeah. to get back in touch with the mud of the great ooze, um, while not necessarily being 
present that would be something maybe we could all send poo sticks down the ooze to each other i don't know yes yes well yeah i think the advantage of being a small organization i can be very fleet of foot and can postpone my program and ch change things around and bring people along with that um that does make a difference but yeah um i think we're going to have to think quite hard about other ways than only using technology to um initiate different ways of of being pub being in the public realm mm. um and doing something that you know and how i mean i don't know none of the campaigning movements i mean you know what is um extinction rebellion going to do now none of the campaigning movements can work without um get, getting together um although i don't know come to think i think i think in the i think probably in the early days thinking back to um how friends of the earth started it started with those i don't know if anyone remember the schweppes posters um it was a it was a you know a publicity campaign on paper that really got them known and i think we just have to get back to some of that probably that's a, that's a nice designer thing to think will about. come into his own <laughs> <laughs> we've had a few more questions come in um, and i'm just going to share them with you now if that's okay mm. um what do you think is the relationship between art and science in environmental campaigning what's the right balance do you think um how do, how do they relate to each other well there has to be um there has to be a symbiotic relationship um one has to they ha, there have to be ways in which um the lang different languages and different approaches can be understood um i once sat on a panel um it was um land, land um, landscape and environment panel which involved art and science and one of the things that came up most frequently was that the um the languages that the vocabulary is different the understanding and the methodology there's not that much difference in methodology in some ways um in that there are, you know, there are experimental methodologies in both fields but i think artists are much more used to opening up into an unknown um mm. well i don't know maybe science I mean, that's that's true of science as well isn't it so i, I think there's probably a lot more ways in which there can be collaboration than we've explored so far. And I think if we're going to sort out problems, people will have to work together creatively and share methods and ideas and in a very open way and not in a protective, I am a scientist, I am an artist kind of, you know, mm. we, we can't put boundaries around disciplines. Um, I think to, that, there sh that there should be interaction at, a, at an earlier stage in people's thinking yeah yeah i wonder if there seems to be a kind of a um it's very easy to subsume a lot of things into the, those two labels i guess one yes. of the things that strikes me is, is the the kind of exploratory and speculative work of a scientist um is quite far from the kind of evidence that gets invoked in policy circles so evidence is firm and fixed and a fact yes. and something we can appeal to and that we're supposed to respond to rationally and i imagine that's you know by the time it takes on that form um it's traveled quite a long way from the initial spark in the lab or the kind of conversation with a student that sparks yeah. the initial kind of um process of inquiry and of course you've worked with geologists and um yeah specialists in microplastics and so on which i think is um yeah. testament to that kind of symbiotic view yes yes and i think um what for instance um you know the the environmentalist world is 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 saying no plastics no more plastics but actually what we learned from um from andrew mays was that plastic is precious and 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 it's keep it's treating it as a precious material that's the key um not not being thoughtlessly wasteful but i mean one of the um, most remarkable things i remember him saying was that every time we wash out a house a paintbrush full of household paint it leaches billions of micro particles of plastic into the drain and the, oh. you think of that the scale of that um you know um that's probably i'd love to work with paint manufacturers <laughs> to you know to um do something about that but anyway gosh yes um another question uh, do you ever start with a provocation to artists and collaborators? So, for example, do you say, I want to start on a particular issue, um, say, environmental justice? 
Um, I haven't done that so far because there have been so many things already, I just already there. We might do that in terms of the way we respond, but not, in the, I, I don't think, I don't think I would, um, well, I don't have the resources to commission work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that, that require that's what, what you need public funding for. I've not had, I mean, I've had bits of public funding, um, but, um, I don't know that I would coerce or push an artist in a particular direction. I'd rather work the other way around and let them be free to explore their, in their way. And then I will then come with a provocation perhaps and w with other people to respond to it provocatively. I think that's where, in a way, that's where the provo provo provocation has to happen. Um, mm. There isn't enough activism that comes from art. There needs to be more. I think that the public are not fulfilling their responsibilities enough. Very um, topical kind of accusation. Just <laughs> thinking about that relationship between art and campaigning. Um, you mentioned some of the classic campaigns from environmental associations and the kind of street located uh, workers of environmental groups in the 70s. What does art bring in terms of awareness um, as distinct to those kind of classic campaigns? What's, what's particular about the kind of awareness that's built through art? Well, often what art does is very quiet and reflective. I mean, thinking about the current exhibition, um, the most moving, well, all of all the work is moving in different ways, but some of the most moving work is tiny. There's the most absolutely exquisite um, installation made by a young artist, Aurora Schiabara, of bees. It's a swarm of bees made out of beeswax and latex. And each bee took her eight hours to make, each single bee, because she modelled them by hand. And that kind of love and devotion and skill and um, patience um, in itself is something moving and compelling. Um, and teaches us about an attitude we need to have if we're going to understand the environment better. Um, so I think a lot of what art can teach us, it can teach us about spectacle and, you know, um, Olafur Eliasson and his giant bits of ice and suns and so forth brings a very welcome attention and spectacle but there are artists doing little tiny gestures that help us think about the smaller things the tiny crawling creatures that we step on without thinking etc um so it's it's many things but you know it depends yeah on, yeah no on that's, that's, that's quite interesting in terms of the kind of the affects it produces in the person engaging with the art this idea that there's a different way of being in the world yeah um yeah. Okay. Uh, another question from the floor. Thanks very much and do keep, keep them coming. Um, could you expand a bit on why you're considering taking the gallery down the charity route and uh, whether you have any particular models at this time? Well, um, it's partly because I've pretty much got to the edge of where I can get, I'm a, at the moment I run it, <coughs> I'm a sole trader. Mm -hmm. I rely on voluntary help. I rely on small grants. I rely on, so I've got people working with me, but um, they're paid for by little grants um, and by the penthouse letting, which at the moment is not let, of course. So at the moment, there's absolutely no money coming in. Um, so I have to look more carefully at public funding and to get that, I need different status I, so i probably become a community interest company rather than a charity okay um, okay so it's it's for fundraising reasons more than anything probably um but also um to consolidate the way i'm working because i already am acting like a charity and acting like a community interest company so i may as well get some of the benefits <laughs> I think that makes lots of sense. Um, zooming right back out again, one of our first questions. What do you think, what's your perception of the different rates of change between the systems that construct our world and um, the speed at which the climate crisis is unfolding? Do you think that we're going to be able to affect systemic change 
um, at a similar rate? Do you think we're going to be overtaken? Um, particularly relevant now, of course, now we've, over the last yeah. few weeks, we've been given a model of how rapidly we can make changes. Well, we, I mean, or, or uh, equally, how rapidly change will happen to us, whether we, want to, whether we want it or not. And I think that's the biggest thing that's been learned in the last few weeks, is that however much we think we know the direction we're going and think we're in control, we're not. Um, and, you know, we're being shown how nature is in, or we're part of nature, and nature is in control um, simultaneously. And it's, um, you know, we're battling to survive um, and I think it's actually very prescient that we're being shown I think more than anything this virus is showing us what the bigger battle the biggest battle we're fighting that we've been ignoring and, and, and being uh, in denial about we're suddenly facing but in a very unexpected way um, mm -hmm. so I think there are so many factors in human society of how change might happen um, and so much interdependence and so much um, you know, power structures that are, have to be overcome. It's immensely complicated in a way we're being shown in quite a simple way where the real power is um, and how we're powerless against it almost. So it, I think it's quite fascinating and I really hope that we might get some proper system change um, in the, the, you know the first banner from friends of the earth said um, system change not climate change, climate change um, yes. I think it's happening the other way around <laughs> <laughs> change will be forced by climate change in a way that we hadn't quite expected or, you know. one of the um, potential benefits perhaps further down the line when the dust has settled and we've um, dealt with the um, whatever's coming up immediately for us might be the chance to kind of reflect on on the boundaries that we draw between social systems and human systems and the other systems with, in which we're embedded and I think if there's anything that would help us do do that it's, it's this um, tiny busy virus yeah. Um, yeah. a last question if that's okay uh, yeah. a question from the floor uh, do you have any plans for future exhibitions themed around art and the historic environment um, so just thinking what I've got coming up, I mean, um, not specifically, I mean, I th there's, there's one coming up, well, it was going to be next summer, but I don't know, may, all things may change now, um, but there's, a, there's, um, there's an American initiative called Extraction at the Edge of the Abyss, and it's really about um, fracking, and so, but it was set up, it was a big project set by um, writers, and they've made a big movement of writers and artists and are inviting um, worldwide collaboration. So I was going to do something about that next summer, which could involve thinking about historic environment um, to some extent. I was going to, but I'm, I was, I'm kind of looking around for artists who would be involved with that. And that, that could go in a number of different directions. Um, but I'm very much open to that in future. I mean, I've got, several things stacking up now there's an exhibition about fungi coming up um, oh, brilliant. there's another one about water so re i will regularly do one about water i think because i sit in water so that seems to be something that needs <laughs> to be addressed a lot um but yeah historic environment i think and built environment i haven't really tackled much at all and i think that would be a great thing especially as king's lynn is such a historic town well of course yes yeah. Yes, and uh, I suppose the past of the gallery's own building, you know, the 1930s warehouse, you know, yeah. what, what goods came in and out, yeah. and what systems was it part of. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I think we've got one more question which I'm going to throw to you, but I'm going to make sure that we understand this is a, maybe a start of a 10 for the chat. Um, so please don't feel you have to give a comprehensive answer. Um, so uh, this, this final question. What extent, uh, to what extent do you think that COVID-19 has the potential to change society as we currently recognise it? Oh, a lot. I mean, if I have, I mean, I have, well, I think, I think both things really, that 
actually I think a lot of people will just want to go back to normal afterwards and they'll be thronging the streets and the pubs and the, and the roads and everything and the trains as before. Um, but I, I'd love to think that um, there will be enormous change in, um, and that we'll think carefully about where we travel to, how, why we are meeting, you know, um, what we're using, um, to, uh, toilet paper. <laughs> mm, mm. No, I mean, you know, the whole lot of uh, a lot of things. I think I hope will change, um, and people will realize about themselves and their behaviour. But also that we'll really treasure the time we have together and not, you know, and be more more thoughtful. Um, well, there's a there's a fantastic note, if if you don't mind, to treasure the time that we've had together, and to be more thoughtful. You've given us a wonderful opportunity to um, to be thoughtful, and although we've not been together in person, I think we've been we, we've definitely enjoyed having a shared experience. Thank you very much once again. Um, we're going to have to get some recorded well, applause or you. something. But very much appreciate you. Giving <laughs> <laughs> Just in, you in, for those that are interested, Thanks. this will be. Um, probably up on YouTube in the next 24 hours or so, uh, and we'll share the link to all attendees. Um, the chat room is now open, so uh, I will be in the chat room talking to anyone um, who's there. Uh, Veronica, you're more than welcome to join us, um, as is everyone else who is remaining. Uh, and I think with that, I'm just going to say one final thank you. And um, when all this is done, I look forward to seeing, seeing the gallery in person in Kings Lynn. Yes. <laughs> yes, very good. We'll have a, a group trip. Well, if, if group trips are allowed, ever. <laughs> There's something to anyway, look forward yeah, to. Or solo trip. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay.